full morning, uh, including the uh, presentation you'll, you'll be hearing uh, soon. So we're, we're starting the day with the, uh, the Goldsmith Award. Uh, the, this award was created to honor the legacy of Dr. John Goldsmith, one of the organizers, early leaders, and constant supporters of the International Society for Environmental Epidemiology. This award is given to investigators for sustained and outstanding contributions to the knowledge and practice of environmental epidemiology. Recipients have typically contributed in substantive and innovative fashion to the methods and practice of epidemiology over many years. The award was created to honor the legacy of Dr. John Goldsmith, one of the organizers, as I've said. Um, this is a picture of him at a, at, at a meeting, and this is a, uh, um, uh, uh, a picture of him as well. We're honored actually today to have two of his uh, children here with us today, who are actually both members of the society as well. And we'll, uh, they'll be uh, up uh, to help present the award at the end of the, the lecture. Uh, the, co the committee is an international committee convened as a subcommittee of the awards committee of the uh, ISEE. And we, the criteria used to select the, the awardee uh, are, are several, including not only contributions to scientific discovery in environmental epidemiology, but methods development, translation of environmental epidemiology into public health policy or through community engagement, inspiration to the field of environmental epidemiology as demonstrated by the recruitment of new professionals to the work or by broadening appreciation of the discipline, mentorship of trainees and junior investigators in the field of environmental epidemiology, and advancing the field through uh, and the community through service and professional organizations such as ISEE. And today I'm really delighted to be able to uh, uh, give the award and uh, hear the lecture from someone who really delivers on all of these criteria. The awardee for uh, 2022 is Francesco Forestieri. He's uh, currently both a senior scientist at the National Research Council of Italy and a visiting professor at Imperial College London uh, Environmental Re uh, Research Group. Although most of us uh, have, have worked with him over the years in his role um, uh, in, in Italy, uh, for a long time as the director of etiological and occupational epidemiology at the La for the Lazio region of Italy, and prior to that as head of analytical epidemiology for the Rome Health Authority. Um, Francesco began his career four decades ago working as an epidemiological researcher, by then trained in occupational medicine and epidemiology, later refining his skills with a doctorate in epidemiology and occupational medicine from the University of Linkoping. With his background, he has pursued important questions with the right methods. The resulting scholarship is impressive for its quantity, more than 600 peer-reviewed papers, and for its uh, impact. Many of these uh, papers are highly cited and, uh, and high profile. His scholarship represents a blend of individually initiated projects and collaborative studies involving populations from across Europe. Over recent decades, uh, uh, that's included many of the major consortia that people are aware of, and he's been a major part of consortia such as Escape, Alax, and Elapse, and AirGene. The result is a, a large and impressive body of scholarship on the health effects of ambient air pollution in Italy and across Europe, array, with uh, addressing an array of health outcomes, uh, and he served really as a anchoring coordinator and participant in many, of these in many of these collaborative projects, bringing strong scientific skill, leadership, and often diplomacy, uh, the last of which, as we know, is often critical to the success of these complex multi-country studies. Professor Forestieri's letters of nomination enthusiastically attested to his integrity and to his talents as a scientist, mentor, teacher, diplomat, and when necessary, advocate. Most recently, many of you uh, have seen uh, uh, Professor Forestieri's work uh, as one of the leaders of the recent uh, WHO air quality guidelines, and I think we owe him a great deal of uh, uh, thanks for his hard work on that effort. I also note that Professor Forestieri is uh, officially a Knight Commander of the Italian Republic.
So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Forestieri, who will give us his uh, lecture today. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Thanks, many thanks. And uh, it's, of course, an honor for me to receive this award. And I have to say, I met John Goldsmith in 1985 in Como. And since then, uh, uh, we have been chatting during the IC conference. Uh, in the following years, and it was also always a pleasure to speak with him and to receive his insight. So it's a, it's a deep honor, and uh, uh, I have to thanks for the nomination, uh, Annette Peters. Uh, Annette Peters is a former ICE president, president is here, and uh, I, re um, I want to express my deep gratitude to her and also to the people who signed the nomination letter, Gerard, Claire, Michal, John, and Massimo, and, and Jordi. Really appreciate your effort. And thanks for the award to IC Executive Council and Award Committee, Mark, Joel, and Andrea. Uh, 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 this is from my heart. And uh, I have uh, uh, a presentation here regarding synthesis of the evidence in environmental epidemiology. My idea is to illustrate today different approaches in evidence synthesis in environmental health and to learn from the experience uh, and how to improve in our discipline. So evidence synthesis uh, has been defined in a recent document from the Royal Society of Academy of Medical Science in UK as referring to the process of bringing together information from a range of different sources and disciplines to inform debates and decisions on specific issues. And evidence synthesis should be inclusive, rigorous, accessible, and transparent. And uh, uh, why this is important for epidemiology and for epidemiologists? Because we have different duties. Uh, most of us spend our time in primary evidence, so design, conduct, analysis, and interpretation of single studies. You know, most of the posters and the presentation are on the first job of the epidemiology. But then we have the duty to produce evidence synthesis and integration, make a synthesis of the evidence from human studies and integrate across various disciplines. We also have the duty to perform impact assessment and cost-benefit analysis, and we need to evaluate the impact of policy and intervention. So this is uh, the complete pictures of our duties as epidemiologists, and I really hope that the epidemiology courses will take all this effort to teach to the new uh, student the discipline. Uh, we have a long tradition of causality assessment in environmental health, First of all, the combinations of uh, the various evidence stream, human, toxicological, and mechanistic um, evidence from IARC. And the last preamble was uh, uh, released in 2020. And I think this is very important for our discipline. But we also have, the, in the history, the four-level hierarchy uh, reported in the, gen in the Surgeon General Report on Passive Smoking in 2004 and the US EPA five categories of uh, weight of the evidence. And I have a, a few slides on this. This is the IARC combination of the evidence from the first monograph. Uh, we have uh, the, uh, re the classification of the evidence according to the report of the Surgeon General. And we have the very famous in environmental epidemiology, the classification cause of relationship and likely to be causal and suggestive of the EPA. So we have a long tradition here. But, and along this tradition, the traditional approach has been to follow the Bradford Hill criteria and select several, uh, several items here. Uh, you can see most of them are regarding the internal validity of the study. But most important are uh, this aspect, like the strength of the association and robustness of the finding, the monotonic exposure response function, and the consistency of the finding across population, age group, uh, time period, the study design. 
so we have a long tradition then, but, uh, and along this tradition, uh, you know, especially for young people, uh, in 1995, Aaron Blair was leading a group of people uh, uh, producing guidelines for the application of meta-analysis in environmental epidemiology, and I think most of us should refer to this document because it's very, it, it, it's an old document, but contain mo most of the critical issue for uh, systematic review and, and meta-analysis. So what's the problem here? Why, why we are speaking about evidence synthesis with this long tradition? Because in the current days, we have a sort of tension between two different approaches. One is uh, on the left side, the so-called grade approach, which I call the mechanistic approach. And on the other uh, side is uh, uh, what I call the narrative approach, the effort to perform triangulation uh, uh, for various uh, uh, evidence, both within a single stream and between streams. Uh, so what is GRADE? GRADE is, uh, is, a met is an approach that uh, has uh, different steps. The first step is to establish the initial level of confidence, then uh, go uh, up and down uh, considering uh, uh, factors that decrease or increase the level of confidence and arriving to a final decision of the confidence rating. Uh, why grade is important? Because WHO in 2016 in the handbook of guideline development said that grade should be used because grade methods uh, represent international agreed standard for making transparent recommendations. So, but we have to be aware that grade uh, was born in clinical medicine and uh, so it's an approach that uh, was imported from clinical medicine. And what is the most important difference between clinical medicine and environmental health? We don't have randomized controlled trials. So it's impossible for many environmental exposure to, to perform a randomized controlled trial. But more important than that, the point of view is completely different. For clinical medicine, the scope, the effort is to evaluate the patient benefit for the environmental health is the evaluation of population risks. So clinical medicine is interested in positive effects, and we are interested in negative effects. So clinical medicine worry about false positive, and we are worried about false negative. Uh, exposure is well defined, exposure is estimated. This is based on human studies, this is based on integration of different streams of the evidence. And most important, the biological possibility in clinical medicine exists before the randomized controlled trials. You, we already have the biological, otherwise we cannot conduct the randomized controlled trials. Whereas for us, the biological possibility is something that we discuss during the course of the study. So the experience and application come from the WHO air quality guidelines that were published in September 2021. And uh, uh, I was part of the effort and part of the discussion, and also come from uh, uh, a very intensive effort that uh, the Health Effect Institute had in producing the HGI traffic review, the systematic review on the health effect of uh, traffic related air pollution. And this is what was conducted by a panel of different investigators uh, under the lead of Anna Boger. So I will take my examples from these two experiences. Um, so uh, the first issue is the, the initial level of the confidence. So as uh, uh, Grade prescribed that randomized controlled trials have high confidence and observational studies have low confidence. And this is surprising because uh, as Rodolfo Saracci showed in this nice table, in 2016, that the uh, convincing, uh, convincing evidence of carcinogenicity for several factors like tobacco and uh, the steel bestrol or benzene or arsenic come from observational studies, not only case control and court studies, but also from case series and ecological studies. And, and this is important to consider. Uh, the false problem of jerarchy of the evidence was already indicated by 
David Sackett. David Sackett is the father of uh, uh, evidence-based medicine. This is an editorial in 1997. And basically, it's time to stop squabble, squabbling over the best methods. And basically, what he said, the best method is, is the one that uh, it can give an answer to the, uh, to the different question. So what, what, what is the first lesson, lesson learned? That observational studies can offer high confidence evidence, especially when randomized controlled study, studies are not available. And in the traffic review, uh, we adopted the strategy to give uh, initial rating of moderate uh, to uh, court and case control studies. But after reflection, we think that future assessment should start with observational studies at high confidence rating. The second aspect is uh, the, the, the factors that downgrade the evidence. And one that is very popular is the risk bio bias evaluation. The risk of bias evaluation exists in, and there are various tools to evaluate the risk of bias. And this is a, an example of the traffic light system. So green means low potential risk of bias, and red means high potential risk of bias. And this risk of bias is done for various factors. And uh, the application is that uh, this is uh, uh, a sort of mechanistic approach. And checklist tools emphasize the mechanics. Um, and, and of course, they are good because it's a sort of standardization. But the checklist do not emphasize the underlying science. And I have a very simple example for this. It's the uh, risk of bias for selection bias. And it's very frequent that selection, uh, in, any, in all the cases where you have low participation rate, you have selection bias. But we learn from AP1 that selection bias e exists only if the selection is related both to the exposure and the outcome. This is a very common mistake. Uh, and then we have what I call the obsession of confounding. And uh, uh, an emeritus professor, Aaron Blair, he also received the IC award long ago. In this methodological paper, he said, despite the lack of evidence that confounding is uh, a common problem, uh, uh, nearly every epidemiological paper includes a lengthy discussion on uncontrolled and residual confounding. On the other hand, exposure misclassification is not treated uh, well. So we have to, to, shrift, to shrift our uh, well, our effort and our attention from confounding to uh, misclassification and, uh, and, and and problem of misclassification. Uh, so I have an example here of the application of risk of bias in the WHO systematic review. So you you see here there is a um, sorry. Okay, so there is. A, uh, here is stratification for confounding. You have 51 studies with low moderate risk of bias and three studies with uh, high potential for risk of bias. And you see the effect is estimates are different. So in the sort of the mechanic, you would downgrade for risk of bias. But my point is you have 51 studies in the uh, low moderate risk of bias. So just consider that evidence, don't downgrade, and, and it's the same for missing data. So the second lesson is better to assess the impact of specific sources of potential bias instead of using risk of bias tool, and this is a wonderful editorial from David Savitz, in, in, and also another one from Kyle Stillen. It's another issue, another factor that may decrease the evidence is inconsistency. And this is a, a nice forest plot from the HCI traffic review on the relationship between NO2 and old cause mortality. You see all the effect estimates, uh, most of the effect estimates are on the right side, are positive. But you know, the I square is 83%, and the prediction interval does not include the unity. So with the automatism, you would downgrade for uh, uh, inconsistency. But you see, the main problem is that the, most of the effect estimates are positive. And the, the size of the effect may be uh, varying, but you know, the message is there is a positive effect. 
So the, the lesson learned is that uh, 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 heterogeneity um, should not generally be used to downgrade the confidence, and this is because the I-square is problematic, and there are several reasons. Prediction interval is problematic, and there are several reasons why we, ha we can have heterogeneity in the effect estimate, including different population groups and different uh, exposure assessment groups. Uh, I have another one um, on publication bias, which is used for downgrading the evidence, and this is a quite important effect of PM2.5 uh, and mortality, and short-term effect on mortality. If you see the eager test, the p-value is statistically significant. But when you stratify for multi-city studies and single-city studies, and you assume this multi-city studies have less problem with publication bias because in the collaborative effort there is no need to deny the, uh, the publication, you have the effect estimate they are quite similar. So there are other reasons for, for uh, the eager test to be positive. So, so the lesson learned that publication bias should be explored beyond statistical methods. And then we have uh, uh, the issue of systematic review and meta-analysis. They are used a lot nowadays, and there is recent papers saying that most of the systematic review have shortcomings in the, in the methodological rigor. Um, but just looking at the uh, scales that are being used to, to evaluate the uh, uh, methodological aspect of systematic review, uh, most, of, most of them are so, I, what I call the bureaucratic factors. You know, having a protocol, having a search strategy, um, having a, a, a duplicate extractions, and, and so on. Some essential issues on the systematic review are missing. And for instance, mixing different study design, mixing the incidence and prevalence, uh, mixing short and long-term exposure. So we have a long list. And, so people evaluating the, the systematic review should go, should not use the, the, uh, you know, the available uh, scales, but should uh, do, I think our work would be to have a better scale for examining the systematic review. And there is one aspect that I think is important. Meta-analysis may miss important studies. And what kind of studies? This is an example of the HEI systematic review. This is the evidence for um, uh, uh, NO2 and adult asthma with uh, increased relative risk here. Uh, it's OK. So the evidence is uh, quite convincing. But there's one important study with 52,000 uh, individuals uh, on adult asthma uh, which was excluded. Why was excluded? Because instead of having continuous exposure, the investigators, crazy enough, use categorical exposure. So the evidence coming from this study is not considered in, in the forest plot. I have another, another issue which I think uh, uh, sh should be considered. You know, uh, most of the systematic review, including the WHO and HEI, did not consider studies coming from causal modeling. Uh, one application for this is long-term exposure, long exposure. So the difference in difference approach that has been used, mostly from Joel Schwartz, but also from others, and that provide most compelling evidence of causality in, in comparison to court studies. They are not considered in the systematic review. And why? Because they are ecological studies. And uh, for short-term exposure, we don't consider studies based on instrumental variable. Why? Because the exposure was not directly considered. Only the instrument was considered. And also, uh, regression discontinuity design is not included. So it's a word of warning you know, for systematic review to go there and consider also the causal modeling approaches. Um, and, uh, and this is also another editorial that I did together with uh, David Savitz of considering all, all relevant studies in evidence synthesis. And lastly, uh, I found this wonderful paper from Alfredo Morabia in epidemiology in 1991 uh, with a parallel between Hill's criteria and uh, David Hume, the philosopher of the 18th century, and, uh, and this matching of the Hill criteria with the Hume's criteria. And the most important to me is 
consistency, or what David Hume come call multiplicity of resembling instance constitute the very essence of power of connection. So the consistency of the finding was something that was coming from David Hume. And in this respect, you know, uh, triangulation, for, triangulation for me is soccer, is fo football. Uh, but this is nice uh, paper from Debbie uh, Lauro in, uh, in 2016. And uh, advocating that uh, uh, having uh, different studies with different study design and providing the same answer, they are very powerful instrument for causality assessment. And there is a nice example of triangulation from the traffic review. It's an example of traffic-related uh, air pollution in childhood asthma. So we consider different outcome, asthma incidence, asthma prevalence ever, and asthma prevalence uh, as active asthma. So different study design. And you see there is a consistency of the effect for NO2, but also for the others. So consistency across different outcomes, but also consistency across different pollutants. And this is a very powerful argument for causality that I think we need to consider. So the lesson is triangulation to improve evidence synthesis. Uh, and then what we did in the, in the traffic review to use the broad narrative uh, approach. So to um, have a, a better consideration of several relevant uh, aspects. Uh, a, a good example that uh, I will not read here, but is the narrative assessment of traffic related air pollution and mortality. Uh, Gerard Hook uh, was the author of that chapter, uh, and, and I think this is a nice example of, of the approach. So in conclusion, there is a long tradition in critical evaluation of the evidence in environmental epidemiology. New experiences have been coming. Great brings some challenges that need to be dealt with. Always prefer a critical narrative approach than, rather than mechanistic approach. And the ideal process remain in problem formulation identification of the key issue and the scientific narrative. And this is the end of my uh, scientific pre presentation. I know like uh, a PhD student, when they present the PhD, they have the 10 page uh, acknowledgement of all the, uh, since they, uh, they start from the parents quite often. I will not start from the parents, but I will start from my mentors to say that this award is dedicated to these people and, uh, and uh, you know, part of the award is, is for them. And uh, first of all, my mentor, Jeffrey Rose, I was attending his wonderful lectures at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in 1992. My mentor, Professor Olaf Axelsson from Lynn Chirping, he, was, he has been teaching me the principles of epidemiology, but also the principle of integration of epidemiology with toxicology. And Carlo Perucci, he has been the director of the Department of Epidemiology for many years, since the 80s and until 2010. And he has been mastering me over the course of the years, teaching me how to do the profession and now to choose priorities. Uh, I have to thank my longtime friends. There are several of them. I will not read the name, but uh, I think uh, my gratitude is very high for these people, and some of them are here, some of them are listening, and many, many thanks. Uh, and then my gratitude my, from my heart to the people of the Department of Epidemiology in Rome. I spent most of my career there, and they're simply great people, and uh, I have a profound uh, gratitude for, for them. Uh, some of them are here, really, really thanks. Thanks also for the effort that we did for the IC 2016 in Rome. It was a great experience for all of us, and we learned a lot from that experience. So I, having a conference will teach you a lot. And thanks to my post-retirement uh, friends and, and colleague. You know, this is my attitude before retirement and after retirement. And uh, I have to, to thank my friends at WHO in Geneva, Sophie, Pierpaolo, and Joe Spadaro, people in Bonn, Michal, Roman, Dorota, people at Imperial College, Frank and, and Claire, of course, people at HEI, Dan, Anna, Eva, 
people at the Italian Association of Epidemiology, they have been friends and, and colleagues with, uh, uh, with a lot of support. And all other friends and, uh, and colleagues here, Annette, Bart, Bert, Gerard, I will not read all the names, but you, you, know, you, you know them. Thanks to Epidemiology Pre Prevention is the Italian Journal of, of Epidemiology. I'm the co-editor now. And the Italian journal was uh, uh, led by Benedetto Terracini for several years. And Benedetto wrote to me uh, a few weeks ago saying, uh, I was awarded the Gold, uh, John Goldsmith Award in 2003. And it's nice that the two editors of uh, Epidemiologia Prevenzione got the John Goldsmith Award. Uh, thanks to all IC colleagues and young uh, researchers, we the warning that you see here, you know, a retired person is always there and has a lot of time to, uh, to tell and, and to speak. I acknowledge my friends and colleagues, uh, they gave to me, especially in the last few years, a lot of support. Anna here and Bert Brunekev is not here, but, you know, my gratitude. And thanks to the woman of my life, uh, uh, really... Uh, appreciate their support. And the last le lesson learned, I want to communicate this lesson to all the young people. Uh, take everything with your heart. If your heart is not there, there is no value in, in, in uh, having that specific path. And thanks very much for your attention and support. Thank you to all, and thanks to David and Julie. Uh, uh, they are uh, John Goldsmith uh, kids. <laughs> they have been friends for so many years, and uh, I'm really happy they are here. Okay.